Welcome to another edition of 89 with Steve Smith Sr., James Palmer with you. We're coming at you every Wednesday morning. Remember, if you don't want to see these faces, you don't want to see uh, Steve's hat, and you're not a Dodgers fan, you can listen to this on Spotify, Apple. It is a podcast as well. we got a monster show, Steve. We're going to start with Jared Goff. Mm. We talked about the division last week, and what did we see? We all wanted to watch this Vikings-Lions game. It was outstanding, and Jared it was great. Goff. Was wanted wanted a few good football games this week. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you were texting me on Sunday going like, what are we going to talk about? Because there's not a lot of great ones here. Oh this was gosh. a great one. Whew. Is Jared Goff in the MVP conversation now? This is his third straight game with over 280 yards passing, two mm-hmm. touchdowns and no turnovers. Mm-hmm. He's the fourth quarterback since 1950, Steve, to have a 140 or better quarterback rating in three consecutive games. The other ones, Aaron Rodgers in 2011, Kurt Warner in 1999, Roger Staubach in 1971. Rodgers and Warner both won the MVP that season. Staubach came in second. He had to settle for an MVP of the Super Bowl that year. Is Jared Goff an M- in the MVP conversation now? <clears throat> Absolutely, he's in the MVP Love conversation. It. You have to, and you have to throw in Lamar Jackson based off oh. his performance last night as well. So let's not act like Jared Goff is by himself, but let's no. also not sidestep Jared Goff as well. So, you know, I got to eat some humble pie because I had them ranked third, and people were bringing yep. that up. And I don't have a problem with it but because here's the thing. It was a little shaky. That game was a little shaky, and you can see that the Aiden Hutchinson absence was there. However, they Mm. did an exceptional job of getting pressure, blitzing, adding more people in the box. Minnesota did a great job of throwing things off, but you're talking about Jared Goff and just everything he's done. Highest completion percentage over four-game span since 1950 with a minimum of 90 pass attempts. Here's the list in these current seasons. Jared Goff, 83.5, 2024. You know who's number two in the 2024 season? Jaden Daniels. Daniels. Woo. Then, back in 2008, Peyton Manning. Yeah, just a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. 79.3, Peyton Manning again in 2008 and 9. Eh. Hall of Famer. New Orleans Saints. Drew Brees, 2017 and 2018. I heard he was accurate. And uh, TB12, 2007 was 79.2. It's a decent list. Then you go down to most consecutive completions to start a game in 2024. There's four people on this list. Four. (laughs) Four. And 18 completions, 15 completions, 14 completions. All Jerry Garden Golf in Detroit. And last, Sam Darnold with Minnesota with 12. Okay. Wow. Pretty darn good, man. You know what stands out to me, Steve? Remember when he went to Detroit? This was a salary cap dump, right? The big part of that trade with the Lions and the Rams to bring Matthew Stafford to LA was really, how was it skewed? Well, guess what? The Lions are going to take on a big part of Jared Goff's salary in doing this. And and this was never going to be a long-term thing. Yep. Uh, in Detroit. I, I, I love that it is headed in this direction and it has made mm. this turn. Be that he is in the MVP conversation when you looked at really the Rams just shipping him out of there because they wanted somebody better at quarterback. Now, the Rams got their Super Bowl out of it. We'll see yeah, they if did. the Lions get their Super Bowl out of it because what stood out to me and why he's in this conversation is well, you and I have talked a lot about Brian Flores and what he has done as a defensive coordinator in the way It was amazing to watch that game, the game it plan was, and the pursuit it, and the chess match that was going on. It was kind of like the he, he went toe-to-toe with Brian Flores mentally from what he did with his offense, the checks he made. He has full control at the line of scrimmage. We all know he's got a lot of weapons. And, so and let, we, let's, we know he's got a great offensive line. Let's slow down here and let's break this down because I I love the way me and you work together because I already knew you. You already know I'm going to bring some statistics because for me, yeah. I know what I see. I like to have the numbers to back up. Am I seeing and assuming in the correct way? Yeah, to match it up. 2021 was his first year with the line. Now, the Super Bowl year... When it started, we started Hill of Rumbling was what, 2019 when they lost to the New England Patriots. And we heard, hey, Jared Goff is the reason they're being, he's holding them back. Is that correct? 
Yeah, it was one of the boringest Super Bowls ever. Oh, 13 yeah. to 3. It was, it was terrible. I've never been there. Right? Oh. So, under pressure, and this is where it's increase and change. And, John, I will get you this. Uh, I will take a picture of it to send it to you so you can have it. Right? 2019 completion rate under pressure. Because that's the part that we know every quarterback makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. Daniel Jones makes mistakes. Horrible mistakes when he's under pressure. He does stuff that you just go, ay, ay, ay. Like, yeah. bro, who, stop. Yeah. There's a lot of quarterbacks. They are two different guys. Oh, when you get them pressure, and I'm not talking about blitz. I'm talking about pressure mm-hmm. where they have to check the ball down, eat the sack, live mm-hmm. for another day. 2019, that year, under pressure, 42%. 88 completions out of that year. Seven touchdowns, six interceptions, 59 first down. Now, it got a little better. 2020, 44%. Okay? Mm-hmm. Four touchdowns. This is, not a, this is not a trick. You know, seven interceptions, 31 first downs. The decline. The numbers are there now. It justifies we need to move on. This is the guy that's holding us back. Right? Mm-hmm. 2021, first year under pressure, jumped up to 51%. Four interceptions, four touchdowns, 38 first downs. Now today. Um, I know that. Ooh, here we go. Under pressure, 36 completions thus far. Almost 70% completion under pressure. Not blitzing. No. Because when you throw a blitz, you just... That's just a trick. Will he be replaced? Throw the flat. That's that's part of the football game. But under pressure is decision making. Mm-hmm. Two touchdowns and only two interceptions. We also have forgotten in case he has 10 touchdowns as well. So he has 10 touchdowns, two interceptions. 2020, the year that they kind of was like, it was pretty much, hey, let's get him out of here. He's already got 24 first downs. Yeah. It's he's it's efficient. Impressive, dude. And it's impressive what the coaching staff is doing, giving him outlets. But it's also really good to see Jared Goff going through his own progressions and sometimes taking a sack to live for another day. There are people right now on teams that are watching film right now saying he just needs to take the sack. Don't throw it up for grabs. Yeah, this is the best part because he also did handle the blitz really, really well. And, and Brian Flores oh, can bring yeah, a lot of did. different things to you. And he handled that brilliantly, Steve. But then the pressure, you're right. He was pressured over half of his dropbacks. 51% of the time he dropped back in that game, he had pressure in his face. But the yeah. thing that stands out to me the most, and this is a trait he's had all along, and now we're kind of seeing how important it is with the way he's playing. He's always been the, like, the coolest guy in the room. He never gets rattled. He's always in control. He's always calm. That's something that's always stood out to Dan Campbell. And now we're seeing with a really good offensive line, good weapons, and his, you can even say maturation with a a veteran player, right? The more plays you see, the calmer you get back there, and he was already calm. He's still taking, like, shots under pressure. Yeah. I no, mean, he has taken some it, shots now. Yeah, it's like he almost averages like t- almost 12 yards an attempt under pressure. Nobody else is over nine. Like mm. he he still tries to push the ball in some of those situations. Yeah, he does. The last part about him and, and the way this offense works, and from a receiver, I wanted your opinion. That two-minute drive at the end of the game to win it. First off, talking about calm, Ben Johnson is the calm. He's running the ball early in a two-minute drive. Smart, and, too, and establishing that they're not going to change the football game. They're going to go. 100%. They're going to go with what they know. And they did a masterful job of keeping Minnesota on their toes. Minnesota was throwing a lot of things at them where they were dropping seven, right? Mm -hmm. Only blitzing four. Sometimes only uh, rushing three, dropping guys in the zone, but making it look like uh, all-out blitz, two-man, zero. It was a really great game. And John, Coach Johnson did a great job of staying diligent in his philosophy and calling a game that wasn't about, oh no, we have to make the, we have to, we're down two, two scores. We got to make this all back up today. He never really got, you never really felt that nervousness by either team. 
And, yeah. and, and after we watch football this weekend, you can say some teams need to take some notes. <laughs> yeah, big time, big time. So this is the last question I'll ask you because I'm curious about it, and this is what I was hinting at. Why does this seem always so in sync? Is it the chemistry that golf has with these guys? Part of me also thinks these a lot of his his players are where they're supposed to be. Amon Ross St. Yeah. Brown's a great route runner. These guys yes, are he where is. he expects them to be. And is it the scheme? Like, why is this so aesthetically pleasing to watch? You know what I mean? Like, some offenses are disconjointed at times. This mm -hmm. just has a flow to it. Is it what, what part of that stands out to you the most by being a guy who's been in a lot of offenses? What stands out the most is, uh, you know, obviously they have a stout offensive line. Huge. And that's the best part is understanding that your offensive line is, is, is really there and they know what they're doing. But what I love is this one-two punch that they have in the run game. You have this, this lightning and thunder where you can get the tough yards. I believe it's Sonic and Knuckles now, Steve. Oh, um, Sonic and Knuckles. my understanding. Okay, uh, Sonic, Sonic and Knuckles. You, but you know the Knuckles can still become Sonic at any moment. True. And Sonic kind of shows you where he can be Knuckles and Sonic too. So they both do a really good job of explosive runs, staying diligent in the run game, which in this offense opens up play action and the deep ball game to get behind the secondary. Yep. But what makes it all work is this coaching staff has done a really, really good job of getting the specialists – so they have the deep home run hitter. They have with Tim Patrick. Shout out to the University of Utah. Tim Patrick. Your guy. They have him in there. Or he's a big target, but he also is physical in the run game. Mm -hmm. So you never really know what's going to happen, who's in the game. When these groups of playmakers are in the game, it isn't, oh, we're only running the ball. Oh, we're only yep. passing it. They could do anything. And the fact that David Montgomery had the knee injury tweak and then had to fumble and the adjustment of saying, hey, our guy is not 100%. We're good. So we're not going to panic. Gibbs, do your job. And he did his job exceptionally well. Yeah. Adjustments. <laughs> I'm a 49ers fan. Talking about lack of making adjustments. I mean, I, you know, I grew up with Adam West. Holy socks, Batman. What are we going to do? They are in trouble. I grew up with Adam West. I thought you personally grew up with Adam West, but yes, no, uh, no, the original Batman. Um, you're right, Steve. You're exactly right. And the, the scary part is, as we move on, is they haven't even gotten Sam Laporta completely involved yet. And so, no. they, I mean, there's still more to come with this offense. It's awesome. Yeah. Underdog is bringing you Boost Tober. New promos and special offerings each day of this month. Check the Underdog app and follow us online to stay up to date on all we've got brewing this month. A couple quick slants for you, Steve, and uh, let's talk about your, are they your Ravens or just our Ravens or the NFL's Ravens or the best team in the AFC Ravens or the best team in football possibly Ravens? Just telling you what the brick says, baby. Oh, he's got a brick. Whew. Look, this ain't no regular brick. You can't just go buy one of these no. at Home Depot. I was on the radio in Baltimore the other day, and they're talking about our show, and they said, you know, the, the host goes, Steve only had about a cup of coffee with us in the Ravens, but we claim him as our own. Who was that radio guy? I don't know. I can't remember. Oh, John? I don't, John? So the main radio guy in, in Baltimore is John. They have two. They have oh, two. They have two. They have okay. two. Uh, yeah. yeah, I haven't been on their show a few times, so they hate me. <laughs> no, he was giving me a compliment. He I had more than a cup of coffee. I had a thousand thousand yards went to the playoffs. Well, I think he's talking? talking about the amount of seasons you had there, not the performance. I'm just impactful. Sorry. Oh, so, impactful. Well, on this that. show, look, everywhere I, you go. Look at the hair. Listen. You see me wave the hair? Oh, I see it. Uh, Lamar Jackson, I, I, I tweeted this out on, on Monday night. I said, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Jared Goff in the MVP conversation. We just had that one on our show, but I said the problem is there might not be much of a conversation about the MVP race with the way Lamar Jackson's playing again. He is playing maybe the best football we've seen him play. He already has two MVPs. This would possibly, if he wins it this year, be his be third, third MVP. Would tie him with Tom Brady, uh, which is wild to think, yet the guy has been to one AFC championship game, uh, hasn't won that. My point to you is what we're seeing with the Ravens right now 
with the addition of Derrick Henry. What does Lamar, what does this team need to do to keep this success that they're having and carry it into the postseason? That is what everybody wants to see, right? The next step, the next hurdle for this team is to have more success in the postseason. Bro, it, it has to be this defense. The defense has to get a better pass rush and get the quarterbacks uncomfortable. I think the, that that part of the game has really, because they're wanting football games and how they're wanting football games, a lot of press and a lot of conversation has been how well the offense is clicking For with sure. the acquisition of Derrick Henry. But what people are not talking about, and they shouldn't because it's they're winning, is the defense and the transitional period with the def new defensive coordinator or uh, who's he's learning, right? But also some of the players that they don't have anymore. And I want to say I was watching a game a little bit and I kind of had to mute it and stop because I love Troy. Yeah. And Buck, great dudes. Yeah. But they call Raquan Smith Patrick Queen, and Patrick Queen plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I did hear that. Yeah. I heard that too. Now, if that was me, all oh, people have been talking all about Steve. See, you can't have uh, you can't know what he's doing. Not all black people look alike in the helmets, though, because you don't really see their face. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I, just asking. I'll tell you this right now. There's no other human being on the planet that looks like Derrick Henry. <laughs> I'll say that right now. And, and this is a point I wanted to get into, Steve. You look at what Derrick Henry's doing right now. He is on pace currently to break Eric Dickerson's record for most rushing yards in a season. Now, he will have an extra game, but right now he is on pace for 2,120 yards. The record is 2,105 yards. Yes, we know in 2020, Derrick Henry did have a 2,000-yard season. He's done it before. Can he do it again when he's 30, when he's going to turn 31, I believe, this season? But what stands out to me the most is we had some backs change teams this offseason. We had Derrick Henry go to the Ravens, which there are a lot of teams are now kicking themselves going, wait, for $9 million guaranteed this season, I could have had Derrick Henry? Uh, that's not astronomical. But the Ravens pull the trigger on it. Right down I-95, Saquon Barkley goes from the Giants down to the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, he's not 30. He's 27. But he is carrying their team right now. He is carrying the Philadelphia Eagles on his back. He is their offense, essentially, the way he's playing. Um, he's third in rushing, second in scrimmage yards. He's extremely important to that team. And then you have Josh Jacobs, who's even younger, 26, but also changes teams, goes to the Green Bay Packers. What is a similarity when you think about the Packers, the Ravens, the Eagles, and I'll throw another team in there, the Chiefs, which were highly interested in Josh Jacobs. When I look at those four teams, Steve, I think of really good front offices. I think of teams mm. that construct teams very, very well. Um, so if these type of teams are going after these backs that have been cast off, whether it's money, whether it's age, whether it's both in their previous stop, I'm seeing some teams that are pretty good at building rosters and are pretty intelligent in how they put their teams together. Yeah. Not really caring about either one of those and going out and getting these players. And I think they've helped change some of their teams. And we can look at some of these older backs too, that I didn't change. Alvin Kamara is still an extremely, extremely talented running back in this league. And the guy's almost 30. So, like, I think the approach to the running back position might be reevaluated a little bit after this year. We're seeing that with the linebacker spot with some teams. The value on a middle mm. linebacker varies greatly from team to team, right? There's some teams like Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco. The value of the linebacker, extremely important. There's other ones that, that don't. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I just want to kind of point this out and say, what we're seeing from Derrick Henry, we're seeing some Saquon Barkley, like, some pretty smart teams have uh, had some interest in these guys and in, in having them turn around their teams, and it's been it's been kind of fun, kind of fun to watch, and we'll see if it continues. Well, well, first of all, that was a loaded, just great information, and as you were talking, I'm thinking about they're spinning a little bit. Under, yeah. I, I'm spinning and understanding when you look at these teams and you 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 go back in the history of it. Sometimes people don't always value and understand that these teams have a philosophy and their and their front office knows exactly how they want to construct this offense mm -hmm. and the defense. They have a direction and they're not really gonna change from that direction. 
And when you look at the Kansas City Chiefs, some of these teams you talked about, and I look at the San Francisco 49ers and compare them, it's understanding that they have a philosophy and they have an offense that fits these mold of players. That's true. But they also are not looking at my system makes the players. And then all of a sudden, if those players are not available because of injury or go out in a game, all of a sudden, you start to see that it's not the system. It's really the player. And now the system is a little bit not as good because you don't have that type of player. Almost kind of like the college game. You know, when I look at Alabama and some of the stories that I've heard with Alabama, one of the things that really started to wear down is uh, every, so this is, you You may not know this. I found this out. Other people may know it, but that's great. Get your own YouTube channel and then we'll listen to you and then <laughs> it'll be cool. So I heard over the years, the University of Alabama under Nick Saban ran the same system of offense. They never changed it. Every offensive coordinator they had had to do their offense. Bill O'Brien, you name it, Lane Kiffin, they had to do their offense because they never wanted to change it because they wanted the familiarity. Well, when you look at some of these teams now, like A, and I'm going off because I got to take you there. I was talking to some people and they asked me, hey, have you looked at such and such receiver? And I said, when there's certain groups of receivers at certain schools, I always go in with an asterisk and I tell the people that talk to me, get him on the board to know if he knows what he's doing and does he know the why he's doing it? Yeah. Or is he being coached to do it because of the offensive mind of that college? And so when that happens, that's where that transition as a young player, where all of a sudden these coaches get these players and they go I need to put this guy because he's a speed guy and I got a possession guy and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and then all of a sudden it doesn't work out that has to do with understanding who you are True. a lot of these offensive coordinators don't always understand each individual player like my number one he's a vertical and horizontal guy my number two he has to be a possession guy who also knows where and how to line up. My number three guy has to have some value, but also be able to play multiple positions without practicing at all because the number one and number two guys are going to get the reps. True. So with all that being said, my point is the teams that are doing well with the new acquisitions, they go out and shop. Now, they may come across hungry, but they go out and shop for a particular item, Mm -hmm. not looking for any item. Because when you do that, you, buyer beware, you start to have buyer remorse because the guy you paid for athletically is good, but aesthetically does not work in our flow of the house of how we want to do things. Passing, Mm -hmm. play action, RPO game, uh, dissect and identifying the linebackers. Can he make adjustments at the line and change the shifting of the blocking scheme? Not every quarterback has the ability to do that or is capable of doing that. And so you got to also understand that with the players and the, all, and the coordinators and the coaches, they have to know exactly who they have and where they're having them versus just getting a guy and go, okay, hey, he's our 10th player. Put them here. They have a purpose, have a plan. That's, that's exactly right. And I think that's the interesting part when to circle this back to these backs I'm talking about. Yes. Saquon Barkley and going out and getting him is not the norm for the Philadelphia Eagles. But what did Howie Roseman do? He talked to his new offensive coordinator in Kellen Moore and said, what do you need? He said, if you can get me Saquon Barkley, that skill set works in the offense that I want to work and it takes our offense to another level. You get the piece that you said fits what you want to do. It fit exactly what Kellen wants to do. And so Howie went and made the move for Saquon Barkley, which I don't know how the Giants didn't think uh, he wasn't going down the street. I think the entire league thought he was going to Philadelphia. But anyway, uh, <laughs> stick with our uh, our quick slants here, Steve. We've talked on this show a lot about rookie wide receivers, but maybe we should stretch that to rookie pass catchers. 
because Brock Bowers for the Las Vegas Raiders, he doesn't just lead all rookie tight ends right now. Mm. He leads all tight ends with 47 catches uh, this season. Coming off a 10 catch, 93 yard performance. I remember in the draft process hearing all sorts of things like this guy is different, which is wild yeah, to hear considering, right? Considering all the guys who have come out recent memory. We've had a lot of first round pick tight ends prior to him. You had Kincaid, you had, you know, Laporta, you've had these other guys that have, you know, come in and made impacts at a young age yeah. quickly at a tough position to learn in the NFL. That's what we should also dive into real quick is this is one of the hardest positions as a rookie to play. Tight end, center, quarterback, maybe I'll, I'll throw a receiver out there for you, Steve. Mm -hmm. No, don't do that. Don't lie to yourself. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> tight end is hard. Um, and and well, what you, do you see from Brock Bowers? Well, here's why it's it, it is difficult because with a tight end, you have your route tree as a pass catcher with tight end. Yeah. However, you also you, you also have to know what the lineman signals and words and terminologies mm -hmm. are as well because they have the different kinds of things that the, that you need to do. So there's what we call a Y tight end and a F tight end. The F tight end back in the day used to be primarily the F tight end was kind of that F for fullback slash yeah. blocking, uh, the blocking ability. Usually the no. Y was the receiving tight end, F was the blocking tight end. And an example I have is Ben Harsock was the blocking tight end in Carolina when I was with uh, Greg Olson in Carolina when we were, uh, Ron Rivera was there. And how that relationship works between Y and F is depending on the play and depending on how that Y tight end and what he brings to the table. I've seen tight ends where the Y tight end is supposed to block. The F tight end is supposed to catch the pass. And I've seen them switch. And, and so the F tight end has that responsibility. But what, what makes it interesting is – you're at the edge of the – right next to the tackle on the mm -hmm. right side because there's the Z over there that's off the ball. If they're sliding right or left or they see something where it's a stunt and they have to shift or, or sift or have to uh, exchange responsibilities, he has to know that communication and has to sit in yep. pass catching with, with the wide receivers, the tight ends, the running backs and quarterbacks and offense coordinator. But then he also has to sit in the O-line room to be able to know what's going on in the run game as well. So you don't become a liability. You start to tip off what they're doing. So Brock Bowers is exceptional for a number of reasons. One, I heard he was a difference maker. His frame is a little bit deceiving. He doesn't look as powerful that he is, and he is. He is. But the other part too is he, you know, he's wearing eighty nine, and there's a lot of great football players that wear eighty nine. It's a couple. He's also just one of those players who understands how to get open. Who he reminds me of? Oh, hit me with this. <laughs> oh, you didn't. We like to compare. Who he reminds me of? We do. He runs a little heavy footed, like another old head who still runs heavy footed. It's just a little bit heavier now. He's older. Is eighty seven. For the Kansas Ooh. City Chiefs in that same division. He reminds me of a young Travis Kelsey. And which route is it? It's the route he ran against the Rams. Where he ran that little China route. Dagger okay. route. Whip route. Where he goes inside and whips out. But the way he dropped his weight and kind of whipped... I was like, bro, he looks like Travis Kelsey. The only difference is Bowers, he walks a little bit like he has some uh, some old Timberland boots. <laughs> right? Are they laced up or no? Oh, not laced up. That's no, why no. he's kind of dragging them. <laughs> <laughs> but the heels are coming out. <laughs> he just runs with such violence and knows how and where to sit in the zone. And then he can finish too. Oh, yeah. Decent blocker, uh, efficient, functional. But really what his bread and butter is, is what he does in his pass game. And he's, he's a damn good football player. Yeah, he really I, – I did that. I did the, the Raiders-Broncos game sitting up in that press box. He caught a ball in the middle of the field and just took off and finished it himself. Like, I mean, yeah. it's, he, he, he can take it the distance. I mean, he's, he's really – let's just be honest what, the, uh, what the, the Raiders are banking on and hopefully some growth this season as they kind of try to figure things out with Devontae Adams gone. He is, 
he's their best pass catcher right now. Uh, and know Donald it. hurt, so you back yeah. with them uh, with Minshew back Magic. With Minshew, Man- Minshew Mania. Here we come. So let me ask you this before we move on. There uh, has been at least one rookie wide receiver at a thousand receiving yards each of the last five years, but there's been a rookie in three of the last four to mm. hit fourteen hundred yards. Mm. I think we're gonna have a receiver, maybe two, get to that number. Do you think Brock Bowers gets to a thousand? He might have. Where's he at right now? I think he's at 477 yards through seven. Ten weeks left, right? Mm-hmm. He can get it. Here's why I'm, I'm I'm worried about it because he's having a high clip of receptions. Okay. However, without Devontae Adams and Gardner Minshew out there, is he going to be considered a dump off king? Where all of a sudden he's getting a high clip of receptions, but not a lot of opportunities to get down the field and and yeah. because now teams are going to start to double him. You could put an edge rusher out there to chip him, to slow him down, get a good pass rush. The offensive line is already struggling. Right? You're talking about a guy who Gardner Minshew does not handle the ball well under pressure, doesn't make swift decisions. Okay. So all of a sudden, can he get that game or two where he has maybe 125 yards versus – 15 catches, like 10 catches for 93 yards. That also has to do with teams are starting to say, hey, we are not going to allow this guy to beat us. We'll corral him and hoping that by corralling him that he'll make a mistake and try to catch that underneath route and try to go for the home run and they can uh, jar the ball loose. So that that's the only reason why I say that teams can start to really double team and game plan for him, which can be problematic until they get another number one wide receiver that other teams fear that could beat us over the top. Got it. But let's just be honest. This is a rare talent, man. You do not talk about tight ends as top Man, you're talking about another 89, bro. 89 is a I guess 89 is a big part of what he's wearing. (laughs) Unicorns. Uh, Let's stick with our, uh, our quick slants here, Steve. Route of the week. Route of the week, Amari Cooper. Oftentimes, you catch a ball for a touchdown, you're excited, but you maybe didn't know the route. You maybe didn't know the play. I've had it happen. I, I ran the wrong route. You run the wrong route? And, and caught the ball. Let's get to Amari first, because I kind of want to have a couple questions about this from an outsider's perspective, about what's going through everybody's mind here on the field. Run us through this Amari Cooper touchdown. Well, here's the tip. All the pass catching guys, when he, he says, alert, alert, look it, okay, hold on, go back, go back. When everybody has their hands up, okay, there they go. they're acknowledging, alert, alert. Yep, because I got you. they want to make sure they relay it. This is how you know Amari has no idea what's going on. And not in a negative way. The, the dude just got there last <laughs> on Tuesday, right? Tuesday. So everybody's saying alert. Amari's saying in his head, man, I don't know what the hell they running. So he has that delayed look at me, how I look. I'm looking like Josh is right here on my he's he said cool. No, that is not what he said. <laughs> I could tell you what he said because right when I said he, he's gonna look at Keon Coleman, he was like When you see calm, Steve, it's not a good thing. Well he said alert. He said, I don't know what that means. Hey, what I got. That's all he said. Yeah. What I got. Not goes, English. Keon Coleman can't tell no secrets. He don't even mumble it. Hey, you gotta uh, you gotta see. He be talking. You see what he does? And hey, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Look. <laughs> so wait, are you trying? Like in this moment, you're like, it's more important for me to tell my teammate than to care if the defense hears me. Yes, because right? here, here's what you don't want. You will be in that same situation. Hey, bro, I forgot. I've been at the lo- I had a guy. We'll talk about the, what guy I had. So go ahead and run it now. Say, oh, okay, cool. Bet. Look. Yeah, yeah. Crosses his face. Nice ball. That's pitch and catch, though. That is. Guess he got that rust off, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the question to me, Steve, is the importance of him running the route that he's supposed to run and not caring that the defense knows it is because you don't want him doing something that's going to get in the way of another route or in the, or get close mm-hmm. to another receiver, right? No? You know what I'm saying? Like, if he, if as he long doesn't as matter if you tell the defense, that's where you're going. As long as, long as the quarterback knows what's going on. You're good. You're good. Okay. 
there's two two examples I've ran the wrong route. Hit me. Well, actually, three. It is probably about fifteen examples I've ran the wrong route. So the first one, most recent, my last year in Baltimore, we're playing the Las Vegas Raiders. Okay. No, actually, they were Oakland then. I was supposed to run in a flat. I was supposed to chip someone, hit the flat. They adjusted. I didn't run to the flat, bro. I ran straight up the middle of the field and threw my hand up and said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> threw the ball to me. Uh, kick, Justin Tucker kicks the field goal. We going to halftime. Was not to play at all. Why am I going to go go into the flat? Middle of the field is right there. Yeah. I went like this. Nobody to chip. Let's just go downfield. <laughs> yeah. Right? Did that. One time in practice, remember Rod Gardner? Yeah. He was in Carolina with me. We had traded for him. He comes in the training camp. He goes in motion. He goes in motion and says, hey, what do I got? What do I got? And I'm like, damn, what does he have? Oh, you curl, 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 curl. So I'm in a slot. Curl, curl, curl. I done forgot my dang route. Because <laughs> you were helping him out? Because <laughs> I was helping him out. Mm. It, it just happens. That's just part of, you know, with your brother, your teammate, you got to help him out. All because right. what you don't want to do is run that route where you've forgotten. We've had double curls, and I'll run the route looking across the field mm -hmm. to see what he has to know if what I'm about to run is correct. Mm. So I, you, we call those those tiptoe routes where you're like, am I right? Oh, I'm right. Yes. So it, it does happen because there's so many plays. Yeah. And so is this good for Keon Coleman that he knows the other guy's route too as a rookie? Seven games into his career? Or he should? Yeah, it's great. Should. That's <laughs> great. Oh, man. Plays multiple positions. Underdog is bringing you Boost Tober. New promos and special offerings each day of this month. Check the Underdog app and follow us online to stay up to date on all we've got brewing this month. <sighs> the Steelers make a quarterback change. Steve, uh, they go to Russell Wilson. Mike Tomlin told Jay Glazer before the game that he went Lone Ranger. This was his decision. I completely believe that that's accurate because I talked to enough people in that building that there is a lot of support for Justin Fields in that locker room with the coaching staff. A lot to like about well, let's Justin say, Let's Fields. say it was. What? <laughs> well, we'll see. Listen. Yeah. I, I did hear coming into the season that the thought process was we're probably going to end up playing both quarterbacks. This probably mm. hasn't played out the way that they thought. They didn't think Russell Wilson was going to get a calf injury pushing a sled. But Russell Wilson comes in, they, they and he goes 16 of 29 for 264 uh, and two touchdowns without an interception. Only takes one sack. Um, still didn't complete a boatload of balls. But what's your initial take from what you saw from Russell Wilson? And then I'm going to give you my take on what I saw from Russ. Well, I'm asked, can I? You want the truth or the lie? The lie would be, man, I knew this was coming. The truth, man, I didn't see this at all. Especially the first couple of passes he threw. I They're was like, them off oh, the field. oh my good, the the ball into the flat. Yeah. I said, what? He, I was thinking what Justin was thinking when he threw that ball. Justin said, man, my helmet on. Hey, hold on, let me get. My I didn't drop my mic. Boy was like, shoot, you got me open. That here. boy loose. Hey, what how they do it? <laughs> <laughs> the James warm up? The Dak warm up? <laughs> how they do it with the with the towels? Yep. The towel. There it goes again. There it goes again. Let me get this guy a new mic. How do they do the towels? <laughs> Howl whipping, he's hip wagging, getting it all <laughs> hey, ready. He was out there getting ready. After that first drive. All right, I'm about to come back in. I hear these. Hey, he also was probably going like that. Look, Justin was also probably going like this. Did coach hear these boos? I hear these boos. <laughs> <laughs> I hear these boos. It was rough. Early. I was completely, I was completely shocked. Um, the one thing that I did watch, I, I'm gonna be interested to see as it goes forward, how does Russell Wilson handle when his first read is not there. Because a lot of the throw success that he had, the contested catches that he threw to George Pickens, some of the passes out of the run game was excellent. But a lot of that stuff you can see sometimes when he scrambled, he was coming off the first read really, really quick. And I think that's why the booze and where's a little bit of shakiness 
that I you started to see, and I, I was really shocked. The Jets really did not um, seem to have a handle on how to neutralize them because the run game was going so well with mm -hmm. Najee not, not not Harris that it just was it, it was great. It was it, it was very surprising. It was okay. extremely surprising to see how well he played, in okay. my humble opinion. All right, <clears throat> let me take you back to last year when Russell Wilson was playing with Sean Payton. And there was a conscious effort, to my understanding, about halfway through the year. If we want to win some football games, we're going to have to win some football games ugly. We're going to have to play some good defense. And what happened to their, their defense in the second half of the season? Started playing really well. It's a big reason why they're yeah. playing really well to start this season. We're going to have to have Russ, a couple reads, one, maybe two, not there. Russ, run for five, slide. This is how we're going to play. We're going to play football. Mm. We're going to avoid the middle of the field. We're not going to throw anything in the middle of the field. By the way, you didn't see a single throw from Russell Wilson in this game in the middle of the field. I looked at the entire mm. chart. There is nothing, Steve, not even a target down the middle of the field. He does not want to throw there. And, and so why? Why is that? that? From what I've heard around the league, he can't see it. It's it he, he because, for a few reasons uh he can't yes. see it. I think you can you can name the multiple reasons. Um and so that was decided back in Denver. What did he do when he wanted to go to Denver? He wanted it, and I was at every press conference. I was there. I live here in Denver. It was, I, I, you know, he, he's he's gonna he's gonna run the show at the line of scrimmage. He wanted to take his game to another level. He didn't want to do all what he did that was very successful all those years in Seattle. He wants to be Drew Brees. He wants to be Tom Brady. He wants to he wants to run the show from the line. He wants to change, and, and it didn't go well, did it? And, and they took that away. Sean Payton took that away from. Him. They went back, and they did win some games. And he had better <clears> stats <throat> than he did the first year. What I saw from him in this game and Arthur Smith running this offense is there's some humble pie from Russell Wilson. This is probably his last opportunity after the way mm. the last couple of years have gone. Okay. And I respect him for going into that building. And this is the appearance it looks like. And this is from some of the information I've gathered. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. Mm. And, and that looked like the way he played this game. Do you need me to do this? I'll do this for you. Do you need me to go under center? He went under center for 41 of his 66 snaps. Like, mm. that's the most he's done since 2016. Like, you guys want me to run under center and so we can run the play-action game, we can run the football? Cool. I'll do that. Like, it looked like he bought in and he was playing not like, what's my five-year plan, Steve? It was, I want to play next week. So I'm going to put my mm. body on the line a little bit. I'm going to go out there and, and try to play a certain way. And to, to circle this back to Sean Payton and, and what they saw and the type of quarterback that Russ kind of is – is this an unbelievable story? Mm. We're in a production meeting for the Christmas Eve game uh, between the Patriots and the Broncos. Sean Payton's talking to me, Kurt Warner, and we're going to call this game. And Sean goes, there's a difference in quarterbacks. There is a Drew Brees that I had. He goes, I got this beautiful Mercedes from Mrs. Benson. Uh, she owns these Mercedes dealerships. I always get a Mercedes from Mrs. Benson. It's got all the bells and whistles, Steve, you could imagine. There's knobs everywhere. You're just in heated seats, motioning seats. You got massage seats. You can adjust the radio. You can do all these things. Drew can do all of that. Mm. While he's driving, he can do this. He can do that. He can do that. He goes, Patrick Mahomes can do this, can do that. He's adjusting everything. He's adjusting your seat. He's he's doing everything under the sun while he's driving the car. He can, he can manipulate all of these things at the same time. Mm. Guys, you know what Russ can do? What? Russ, Russ can drive the car. Ooh. <laughs> so essentially what Sean is saying is, and he did go on to say, but you can win with your guy driving the car. It's Absolutely. Go back and do the simple stuff. We need you to play Kiss. this way. Keep it simple. And Exactly. And didn't isn't that the way this kind of looked? As it was Arthur Smith is, we need you to do this, this, and this. We don't need you to do those other things because they haven't worked out. And I think mm. Russ has accepted that. And Russ is okay with that. And I think that's why we went out and saw it go down the way it did. Okay. That's all cute and dandy. Now I'm looking at the schedule as you're oh, talking. The second half of their schedule. Is a molly whopper. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yes. November 10th, they play the Washington Commanders. It's going to be interesting. Does he want to play hero ball or is he going to play conservative ball? Yep. November 17th, Baltimore Ravens. The 21st, you got the Cleveland Browns, right? And we're not talking about the team in itself. We're just talking about the defense and the complexity of these uh, defensive coordinators. Good point. Right? And Aromo, December 1st. Then you got the Cleveland Browns, December 8th. December 15th, Vic Vangio. You don't think he knows what's going on? Then the Baltimore Ravens, the four days before Christmas, the 21st, and then on Christmas. 
by Humbug, you got <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs. And it's not even the players name. They end uh, no date yet with Pittsburgh at Cincinnati. And the reason I'm bringing all of this up has to do with if you're talking about simplicity, later in these games, simplicity is not going to be able to make it. You're going to have to have a little bit of creativity because you're saying 60 plays a game, right? And so by that time, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that's 12 games, 60 plays a game. That's 172 opportunities to really narrow down. That's not analytics, bro. That's just watching film 720 times that you now get to see exactly what a team is doing. Their identity is really there now. There's no fooling anybody. You can fool them with this, with maybe a post corner, but that post corner is only going to be ran in that post out of so many personnels at True. certain particular hashes. And so you start to really see what teams can and cannot do offensively and def- defensively. So that's the part where I'm interested to see by that time is Justin Fields back on the field or has enough film been out there that teams now are backing the Pittsburgh Steelers into a corner where they neutralize the run game and now the play action game and a deep threat is not there because they turn this team into a one dimensional team. True. So that leads me to say, Steve, this is possible. What happened on Sunday night is the worst possible thing that could have happened for the Steelers. Why? Would it have been better for this just not to work? Or And you go back to Justin Fields. Or, let me say it this way, in the manner in which it happened. You, you were a receiver. That ball, you texted me right after it happened. That catch by George Pickens down the sideline. You texted me. He's that getting grabbed. Was, was an outstanding catch. And it was P.I. P.I., outstanding catch. His touchdown catch, the ball is underthrown. The yeah. other deep ball he had... It's underthrown. It goes off like the helmet and the shoulder of the defensive back, and and, and George Pickens grabs. Correct. Like these aren't these aren't darts. He's got a great deep ball. He always has had that. Uh, I heard the word moon ball. It was like a drinking game on Sunday night. If you were smashed by the end of the game, if every time you heard uh, the word moon Chris ball Cone. come out of Chris Collinsworth's mouth, uh, it, it was it was a you know it was a, it was it was a scene, man. But you also were going against a, a secondary that was just hit with injury after injury after injury. Yes, they were. But I'll close my side of it with this. My thought was with all of I, everything I told you, Steve, is, is is that a false sense of hope? That that is going to be consistent and that's sustainable. So can we expect it, can we expect this lucky charm rust to be there? Because there the were some the bad season. throws, bro. Exactly. So that's that's kind of my thought. I, I I think if you really break it down and you always do this with games and, and you see it better than anybody, is it wasn't perfect. It wasn't this outstanding. Well, no game is perfect. So let's, exactly. Let's but make you know what happen. I mean. It, I don't think yeah. it was what a lot of people are making it out to be. Now, I do think the Steelers are in a very good position to where you can go back to Justin Fields. I think you can. I think first yeah. Justin can handle it. I think the team would be fine if you had to go back to Justin Fields. And I think you have to give yourself an opportunity now that I look at it. Mike Tomlin wanted to see, I, okay, we're 4-2. and two. Is there more to our offense if we changed quarterbacks? To have the luxury to take a look at that, like the where where they're at, and you go from four and two to five and two to have the luxury to take a take a look see at your quarterback see? situation halfway through the year is 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 pretty impressive. And I think now that I kind of have pondered over this a few days, is like if you don't have one of the top guys, you might as well see everything you have at the quarterback spot because they don't have a franchise franchise guy. So let's see what both of these guys can bring. And maybe we're better off than maybe some of these other teams that don't have a franchise guy, and we got two options. It's interesting. It's going to be interesting the way the rest of the year goes. Well, does I also think with Russell Wilson coming in and throwing some of those passes, it will trigger Justin Fields to maybe push the ball down the field a little bit more, understanding that they need to push the ball down the field. That's a great point because you got the sense through the first six games, Steve, that Justin Fields a little bit was playing, I don't want to lose this job. Yes, he was playing cautious. Yeah. He was playing so, cautious. I mean, um, the offensive line has not been outstanding this year. Um, they've been better. And Arthur better. Smith does a good job of scheming up run plays, right? Oh, he he does I that. His, I, the, the thing that I think is sometimes Arthur hasn't really 
had a a great wide receiver crew um, and a quarterback situation to really show and display that his creativity in the pass game. They're still looking at receivers right now. We got till November 5th. We'll yeah. see if they add somebody. Um, so can we talk about, though, can we just address the elephant in the room? Because I, I, I notice a lot of people aren't talking about it, but I, I would like to talk about it. Okay, Steve. Um, John, I need you to go online. And we're just going to let uh, Aaron Rodgers eat his booger on national TV and not talk about that? Like, that's nasty, dog. Hello? Hello? Does this, Does this thing work? Does this thing work? My man dug in his nose <laughs> with the same finger and then looked at it. Come on, Rodgers. You a booger eater? It's a booger eater. Hey, bro. Look at this. This is unacceptable. No, he ain't booger. He is a booger eater. He Look did at not him. go in too the deep. Oh. Whoa. Pause Jerry's it. Pa right there. Right, the outside. right there. Pause. That's a dig. That's, you think that's a dig? I think the angle of the finger, that, Man, is, a, stop that is a scratch it. downward. Boy, unless stop. That, unless that's a Look, a that, that's a dig. Out. You're still in your nostrils. There's a possibility that there's a booger, right? Look. Look, that's. Well, I will say this. I don't know how deep he went, Steve. I'm not sure how much of a dig it is, oh, but so guess what? To go from there to there, and you got a very accessible towel around your neck. And you don't use it. And you don't use <laughs> it. It's a towel right Come there. On. Look, he look, he wiped it off because it was a slimy one. He was like, ooh. <laughs> slimy. Nasty. Look at him. I, didn't, I haven't Bro. seen that yet. I don't know how I missed Bro, it. Bro, he was eating his boogers. That's unacceptable. T hey, tighten up, man. <laughs> tighten up. But I want to start with uh, you this past weekend. You were like Mick next to Rocky Balboa. You were a hype man getting into the arena. Uh, you were there walking with Morgan Wallen. Whoo! Coming into the stadium. Like, how did this happen? And, and what is that walk? What are you guys talking about? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Everybody wants on. He's to pulling know. his earpiece out and he's like, he's like, you're making him laugh. Like, I want to know what's happening during this. Take me there. So Morgan's uh, whole deal is everywhere he goes, he, you know, has a guy, uh, someone from that area uh, that he believes should walk out with him. And so I was asked. Say it, Steve, a legend, a, le a legend. That's what every headline I Google. <laughs> Panthers legend. <laughs> well, my daughter loves country. You took her. And so she's like, uh, why you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what that's a perfect example of, Steve? I'm going to say this right now. It's a perfect example of you raise your kids right. Did I? Because uh, uh -huh. I, I feel like sometimes I'm a legend outside of my home. But inside my home, I'm just a peasant. A mere peasant. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what happened. What we're talking about while we're walking, what mm -hmm. do you think we're talking about? Football. No. You know what I've been getting a lot? Golf. Was he asking about golf? Yes. Oh, I knew it. He was like, bro, let's play golf. I said, let's go. Okay. Yeah. I said, I'll come to you. I love that. I mean, usually you play golf with four people. You guys got two, two empty spots. I may be able to sell that spot because several people. 